Good morning, everybody. I got a little poll to start us off here today. Um, if you are a member of the human race, raise your hand. Now, there's a few people there that didn't raise their hands. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you are a um, Oilers fan, raise your hand. All right, if you are brave enough to admit you're a Calgary Flames fan, raise your hand. All right, we have one very high one in the back there. <laughs> uh, uh, if you have ever been to a church service where you did not know the language of the service, raise your hand. All right, it's amazing. That's quite a few of you. How many of you could simultaneously translate my sermon into another language uh, as, I, as I give it today. All right. It's great. I didn't see any hands. You see, um, the ability to have this vision that we have in the text that we read, people from every tribe, tongue, and nation standing before God is kind of mind-blowing when most of us can't simultaneously translate another language on the fly. Um, see here. All right, our, our text is taken from this section, and this opening scene, I think, is really important. We've got this opening scene of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation standing before God, and they are absolutely exuberant. They're ecstatic. They're ecstatic in praise. They've just lost themselves, and they're just beaming at what they see, and they see this lamb. They see this sense of cleansing. They feel fulfilled, and I think this is the vision that we are about as a church. We are about as a church in terms of mission is to see people come together and just be totally ecstatic in the presence of God. And they are ecstatic in the presence of God. And they are from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Every ethnic group is there, and they're all expressing themselves. Now, they're not expressing themselves in a dominant language. They're not expressing themselves just in, in the major languages of the world, in Arabic or French or English. Uh, they're expressing themselves in their mother tongue. They're expressing who they are. And you know, when I first pictured this throng in front of um, the throne of God, I kind of picture them as the way I've seen some artwork pictured this, this, uh, this scene. And you see people from all these ethnic groups, and they all have their ethnic dress on, and they all stand before the throne of God. But if I look at the text, it doesn't look that way at all. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They're all wearing these robes that are white. And so suddenly, the ethnic distinctions in what they wear isn't all that important to them. But they're still identified. And so they're identified with the language that they are speaking. Now, the whole metaphor of washing yourself, washing your robe in blood and it coming out white is kind of, uh, doesn't make sense. I mean, you wash something in blood, and what does it come out? It comes out as red. But here they wash their robes in blood, and it comes out as white. So this is obviously a metaphor, a metaphor of something else. And it's a metaphor of people who felt dirty in some way, being cleansed by Christ, and then having this exuberant experience that they no longer feel dirty, and they feel free to finally be who they were meant to be. And so the question is, what did they wash themselves from? And, and you know, it's amazing. All the different reasons why someone may feel dirty. You know, some people end up with this sense of dirt, not because of anything they did, but because of something someone else did to them. They were degraded, they were abused, they, they, they were hurt, there was hurtful criticism, maybe bodily they were molested, and so they have this sense of dirt, and even these people, they're going to be cleansed, they're going to stand before the judgment seat, and they're just going to exuberate because finally they feel who they were meant to be. There's other people who deal with dirt, they deal with shame, they deal with guilt. 
And in this throne, they too are going to finally feel like who they were meant to be. They're going to have that shame taken care of. They're going to have this guilt taken care of. They're going to feel free, free for who they were meant to be, free to be honest, honest who they are. And I don't know about you, sometimes, you know, the sense of not being genuine and not being genuine can also make people feel dirty. And so often we know who we should be and we are not who we should be. And so we feel inauthentic. We may feel inauthentic as a Christian. We may feel inauthentic as a person. We may feel inauthentic as a husband or a wife. And God wants to take that inauthenticity and say, look, I want to make you and remake you in the image that you were meant to be. And this too is washed in the blood of Christ. Now I find it interesting that the desire for all these people is to wear these white robes and to express this in how they dress themselves. What has changed on the inside is expressed on the outside. Now in this forgiven state, it's very interesting when we take a look at the text. Here we have a picture in heaven. We have a picture in heaven, and then we go on and we read, they are before the throne of God. This is obviously in heaven. And serve him day and night, and who he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. And I got to thinking, why in the world in heaven should God be sheltering them with his presence? And these are people who, who need the sense of shelter. And even in heaven, God is going to be there, and they're going to be free. They are not going to be afraid of being abused again. Never again will they hunger and thirst. They have this sense that in heaven, there's going to be no hunger and thirst. And you think about people in the world who feel like a second-rate citizen. Maybe they're homeless, and they're looking for enough food to eat. They don't have enough drink to have. And they, too, will feel this sense that finally I am who I am supposed to be. The sun will not beat down on them, nor the scorching heat. You think of us in our global warming. You think of parts of the world where people are, I think of these pictures of Sudan and this bombing, and people are just taking their stuff and trekking through the desert looking for a place to belong. And here, even in heaven, the sun will not beat down on them, nor the scorching heat. It's this baggage that is going to be taken care of. And they stand before this the throne of God, and all this baggage that we experience in this life are going to be taken care of. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. How many of us look for a mentor, a mentor to guide us? And even in heaven, we're going to find that mentor, that mentor to guide us when we need it. You know, this is, in a way, an odd picture. And you see this woman without any knuckles. And so often we think, you know, the gospel really doesn't make an impact. The gospel is meant to make an impact. And in heaven, obviously, it makes an impact. And so I was working amongst Delani, and this is Delani Widow. And we were making books together, and I, I asked them, how... Has the gospel made a difference in your community? And right away they answered, you know, before the gospel came, when somebody died in her family, when a husband died, uh, what we would do is the widow would get one of her knuckles chopped off, and sometimes the mothers would bite off the knuckles of some of their babies. And so you can count up here, probably one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people had died in her family, or they were bitten off as a child. And they said, we don't do that anymore. We don't need to worry that if, if somebody dies, that their spirit is going to haunt us, and if we don't cry enough, and our family doesn't cry enough, that, uh, you know, we're going to be possessed. We have the gospel that has changed. What has changed? The abuse of women. The abuse of babies. I'm involved in, right now, uh, mentoring people, and I'm involved in uh, 10 different Bible translations in Africa and Asia. And I'm working with one pastor. His name is uh, Katete. He's in uh, Zambia. 
And he's doing the Bible translation in his mother tongue. And I asked him the same question, how has it changed? And he said, well, you know, ever since people have started reading the Bible in my Sengha language, um, we used to have this saying, and it was kind of like you read in the Bible, spare the rod and spoil the child. We said, spare the rod and spoil the wife. And he said, wife abuse has totally gone down. We don't need to do that anymore. We have seen how Jesus loves us, how he wants us to love us, and we don't need to do that anymore. You see, there's freedom. There's freedom from her. We don't need to worry about the spirits anymore. There's freedom as love comes in, and we need to love one another. I remember talking to another Lonnie man, and he said, well, let me tell you how it's changed. We don't burn our children anymore when they do wrong. We don't put our hand, their hands in the fire. Why? Because the gospel changes the way we look at the world. See, when God begins to take our rightful place in our community, love is going to have an effect. For the Lonnies, it changed them. It changed them drastically. There was a third generation Lonnie, and I asked him. He was going to the university, and I asked him, uh, I actually, he approached me. I gave a, a speech about uh, linguistics and languages in their area. And uh, he was studying anthropology, and he said, um, you know, I'm trying to do this study about the heritage of my own people. And I've gone to the elders, and I've tried to interview them what life was like before the gospel came. And they refused to talk to me. And I said, why? Because the last thing they want is for us to go back to the way life was before the gospel came. Yes, we get a taste, and we are meant to get a taste of what heaven is like here on earth by how we as a church deal with the people around us as we love those around us, as hearts are changed, as this message sinks in that we don't need to have this fear, that we can love our neighbors. But how in the world does this happen? Does this just happen? Do we have suddenly people from every tribe, tongue, and nation stand before the throne of God? This doesn't just happen. So how does it actually happen? It happens with a lot of work. Just like you get the parable in the Bible with the lost sheep and they go, the, the shepherd goes and looks for the sheep. It starts the same way with people around the world who, who don't have the word of God in their own language. Let me make this practical. Let me take you to Indonesia here. It's a nation, we have capital, we have high-rises, we have isolated communities, we have cities of 12 million people. And then the first question is, where are these people who don't have the scriptures in their own language? Where are they? So we send out people. We send out people with something called a phonetic alphabet, and they go up and down the rivers, and they collect the same word list, all right? And there's words that occur in every language, uh, rock, sun, moon, eye, hand, all these words. And they just go up and they collect the same word list. And then uh, eventually we get all this data, we get GPS coordinates, and then we log this onto a map. So they get this and then um, we get two maps. And on one map, we have all the languages in one area. Now this takes about two years. This is not short-term missions. We also got to figure out a lot of these languages are dying. As roads are built, as people intermarry, is it still worth doing the Bible translation in these languages? I have people who started uh, Bible translations 30 years ago. The language has shifted. The kids don't speak it anymore. Just the old people are reading these languages. What's next? We got to teach these people. We got to learn the language. It's not like you go to French school or German school. You've got to learn it without a teacher present. You've got to create an alphabet. All right, if they're going to have the Bible, an alphabet needs to be created. How do you create an alphabet? Well, we create Arabic-looking alphabets in Arabic-speaking countries. We create uh, alphabets that look like South Asian script in South Asian countries, uh, Coptic script in Ethiopia. We've got to understand their grammar. We've got to understand their discourse style. We have to do literacy. We have to do all these things before we even start the Bible translation. They still don't have the Bible in their language. 
Then we've got to figure out people who are willing to work on the Bible. I work with one gal. She is somewhere in the Himalayas. She is, her family is the only Christians that speak this language in a group of 7,000 people. Very difficult. Very difficult to check the Bible to see how good the translation is because if she gets found out, uh, she gets hauled off or kicked out of the community or whatever. And then we're dealing with the biblical text itself. For God did not give us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. What in the world is this all about? If you have come to church a long time, right away you think, oh, I know what that means. But put a different hat on. Is this God, all right, he's sending you a spirit of fear. He's sending you a spirit of love. He's sending another spirit over there. So they read the text and they interpret it very differently. So then you're struggling. How am I going to say the spirit of fear? Is this a feeling of fear? The publican, standing afar off, would not lift so much as lift his eyes to heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. What is a publican? Smiting your breast, the Lani smite their breast in pride. If I did this translation, I would have just the opposite meaning as to what the original meaning actually intended. It's supposed to show humility instead of pride. For what does it profit a man if he gazes to the whole world and loses his own soul? Huh? People lose their souls? Where's my soul? All right, what does losing one's soul mean in this context? Do I have to make that explicit? Is it the essence of who I am? Now you have all these very terms that are totally outside of uh, the wheelhouse of a lot of these cultures that we work for. Propitiation, bronze, sackcloth, incense, wolves, angels, kingdoms. I work with hunter-gatherer groups. All right, they have no sense of a kingdom. There are no kingdoms. So when we talk about the kingdom of heaven, what is a kingdom? What does the term kingdom refer to? It makes absolutely no sense. It's the reign of God. All right, it's the reign or the... Here's a bit of the process. We do the exegesis, we draft it, we keyboard it, we go in and we check it. We check it with the local people, we read it to them, we ask them questions. What do you understand when you read this text? What do you understand? If they give the wrong answer, then we go back and we make another revision. We test it, we do back translations, we bring outside consultants in, we test it again, final read-through, do we add pictures and footnotes, uh, and then the whole reading and writing aspect starts. We make Bible apps, we produce the Jesus film, we encourage ethno-arts, Ethno arts are hymnody, songs in their own style so they can worship, so that the picture we have in this text actually happens. That the heart is transformed, that they sing and make music in the way that expresses itself from their heart. And I just want to thank you. I want to thank you that as a church, you realize that this vision that we have in Revelations is coming to pass. That you're invested in that. That you're invested in that through us as well. And you're invested in these ten guys. One gal. Not all the pictures up there because we have security issues. We work through VPNs to ensure some of these people in their communication aren't discovered. But this is happening and Greenfield is involved in seeing the Bible translated in ten different languages around the world. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. You know, at some point, you're going to be in heaven, and there's somebody in a white robe next to you, and you're going to turn to them and, hey, where are you from? Where are you, you know? Well, I, I'm from um, Ethiopia. Oh, I know a guy. Who, he was involved in a Bible translation in Ethiopia. Dude, you made this happen? Yes, my church made this happen. Thank you for reaching around the world to do something that we enjoy doing. Why do we do this? So that we can look, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every tribe, nation, people, language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes. They were holding palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our Lord who sits on the throne and to the Lamb.
This is our vision. This is what we're about. We're about ecstasy and worship. Losing ourselves. Being sheltered. No longer worrying about the elements, about hunger and thirst. And doing this with people from everywhere. And thank you for supporting us to allow this to happen. Amen.